<laughs> I know a few people in the second row. Uh, so my name is Fiona. I'm a producer at Blender now. My first conference uh, with a red <laughs> lanyard. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, two short films, actually, because uh, Hjalti was like, yeah, but we didn't talk about charge last year, so really, like, I should have my talk also, my moment of glory. I mean, you kind of know the guy. Uh, and Rick is not going to be here today, he's the director of Wing It, but uh, he has also some family duties on the weekend, uh, so Hjalti will have all the limelight. Um, so it's not a fight, it's presented as more of a fight, it's a comparison, because this is what we do at the Blender Studio, right? they create and we share <laughs> and uh, lots of things have already been uh, posted on the blenderstudio.org and other you know tweets etc about all the marvelous things that those people are doing but here we're gonna get it made be into some more details some things that they don't really want to put them black and white you know on the website uh, and hopefully you will learn a thing or two like i did in the past few months working on wing it so without further ado Let's uh, give the mic to Hjalti, yeah? Hello! Hello. So, uh, you know, the arrow key, okay, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Hjalti. I have had a lot of different jobs at the studio. So, and for these two films that I'm supposed to compare, I also had kind of different kinds of roles. You might also be familiar with me as the hype man in the photo booth yesterday. I have lost my voice, uh, but it was a lot of fun. Um, when it comes to the different things, uh, it's so kind of different regarding my role that I wanted to latch on to like a thing that actually is the same, which is the editorial. So uh, as I was going through the vault of old versions of one, ver one film and the other, uh, I realized that, uh, you know, this is like the beginning stages of me slapping something together for charts. And then I realized it's uh, maybe what is the more interesting comparison is not something right from the beginning, which is not a fair representation of what the thing, full thing looks like in the editorial, but also not at the end, because there's been too many cleanup passes at that point. So it looks too squeaky clean. So I grabbed uh, two edits that are like just past the halfway point. So it's really messy and disgusting, you know. And uh, yeah, 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 a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, and I thought, okay, maybe uh, an interesting thing to highlight here is the hell is this? Because there's a lot of little bits and pieces in it, and there's like, uh, there's a pattern to the madness, I, I swear. Um, and this is also just to tell people, Gesundheit, this is also to tell people that uh, when you're doing editorial and such, uh, you, it's not that there is like this one guiding principle that just everybody, it's an industry standard and everybody should do it. Uh, you can kind of wing it, hey. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, just to figure out, especially if, if you're at a halfway point and you haven't done like cleanup passes and whatnot. So uh, that is temporary sound effects. Uh, a lot of that is me just in a microphone or like, you know, with a balloon or whatever it is. Uh, we have some temp vocals, that's usually also me, like meow, rawr, rawr, whatever on the microphone. Then we have, this got a little jumbled up at some point, I guess, but I kind of have the renders over there. And then uh, I like having uh, kind of an archeological dig where as you go down, you find like old remains of kind of the layout or whatever it is. Uh, but here we got the meta strips and that's a common feature for our studio because we use those as basically glorified color strips that have a you know, beginning point and end point, and then that hooks up to our Kitsu add-on, and there the information flows, and uh, we can use that for cool stuff. Um, that's the layout slash animation. I think uh, this is like right after a cleanup pass where some of the layout had kind of been taken away. Uh, so just imagine this being more amazing. Uh, then there's the previ previous animatic. Uh, that is usually a jumble of mess, which is fantastic and a lot of fun to work with. And then we got the temp score. Now, uh, why is there so many? It's because uh, I wanted to make sure I was constantly rotating different temp stuff so we would never get married to any one kind of a temporary score because otherwise we don't give the composer like full reign of making something and not everybody just gets sad at, oh, what about that one score that you kept using for 20 versions or whatnot? Uh, yeah, this is just temp credits or whatever. So, a fair comparison to Rickety Rocket. 
as it was formerly known between, uh, before we wang it. <laughs> um, similar stuff going on there. This is you know, a version right after the halfway point of all the different versions. Very similar kind of structure. Um, temp sound effects, temp vocals. That's really where I did my best doc work. Uh, meta strips again. And then we got the previous layout animation. So this actually was slightly different because um, we were using more sketches for it. And then uh, uh, I was handing the editorial back and forth between uh, me and Rick for a couple of times. But, and everybody has their own way of working. So I think it got a little messed up at some point. Um, but it's more or less there. There's the animatic and then the, the temp score. And we tried also to do a couple of versions. So here's the comparison. And uh, honestly, from an editorial point of view, I mean, it's kind of you know, the same way of making a sausage. I really, it's, so I have nothing interesting to say. I'm sorry. I was tasked <laughs> to do this. I really, it's like, but uh, I guess one primary thing which I just mentioned, which is in Wing It, we were relying at, in the beginning a little bit more on sketches. And in one segment of charge, we, uh, I did this kind of floor plan thing that I animated. And I did kind of link, you know, uh, time that, uh, <laughs> I totally know what I'm doing. Time that roughly up with, you know, the stuff here. And it was great for spatial uh, awareness and try to figure out where everything is. Also because things had to be designed later. Uh, spatial awareness here was a little, a eh, little bit loose. Uh, still, there was some, but it was a little bit loose. So anyway, let's uh, move on. So characters. Speaking of characters, uh, who is it? Who does the thing? It's Julian Kaspar. It's hard to remember who made the characters. <laughs> um, okay, yes, I'm Julian Kaspar. I'm a character artist at the uh, Blender Studio. And uh, I'm gonna, I wanna show a bit of like uh, the differences between uh, where the challenges were lying uh, between like charge and wing it. I'm actually going to go the other way around, starting with wing it. So here's like one of the original concepts that were like made really early on. And that sort of like summarized the dynamics between the characters. Um, the, like I, I really love the, the exploration process that we, we did with uh, the characters during that movie production. We had usually the tendency to kind of like rush it a little bit and uh, um, do like some concept thing, but then once we go into modeling the actual technical execution, we kind of dig our way into that. But this time around, there was actually like a lot of interplay between uh, concept artists and sculpting and also the other departments. Um, our uh, art director and concept artist, Vivian Lukowski, she was like on board for the entire thing and constantly doing drawovers, which helped a lot. So even early on when we fi were figuring out the character designs, they were, uh, we rarely had them in a default pose. They were constantly in an expression or some sort of pose to figure out the character designs. Because at the core, the character designs were pretty simple. You just like, you can draw a bunch of variations and then you pick which direction you want to go for. It's a lot of possibilities, but then you kind of stick to it. And we mainly just focused on trying to figure out how to make this work in 3D. And that's where the fun part lies because um, uh, we were pre a lot early on with sculpting and, uh, and using Eevee just to get us sort of a sense of how this could look like, but also how the characters can deform because we wanted to really the, have this 2D animated uh, feeling to it. Uh, so we were testing out the deformations and keeping it very rough, only putting like preliminary shapes, anything that sort of sells what we're going for. And uh, some of the cases we kind of took it too far. Like overall, we, we tried more than we could implement in the end. The, the timing and the budget just uh, couldn't quite afford this. But in theory, this is totally possible. I would say we, we could have gone for it where we could just really tailor the character designs to a uh, camera angle and uh, d just go do, do crazy things. Like sometimes the experiments were really fun just to see, can we disconnect the mouth? Like, like in a, this really toony style or even just completely have the character head differently shaped from certain angles. Um, and then uh, this is still like sculpting. And then we didn't even usually 
finish the sculpt. It, like the more finished version was usually just the overpainting. Um, so it was constant back and forth. And we were getting to a final character design, uh, mostly in painting, and then uh, only really wrapped it up and polished it up once we needed it for retopology. Um, and uh, yeah, even just when it comes to expression and post-testing, we did like very little in uh, 3D, uh, just to, to prove if something is possible. And then uh, a lot more variation was done in 2D expression drawings and paintings. Uh, the, so there was a lot of emphasis on the whole design aspect and how we want to do things. The retopology part in comparison, like the actual modeling was fairly simple. We just needed uh, to make something that is like tailor-made towards like the two or like three characters that we had and uh, just kind of focused on, hold on, oh, no, uh, focused on uh, stress testing it, seeing if it's, yeah, uh, if it's, if the topology can perform and that can even be done like in something like very simple deformation test and then handing it off to the riggers and seeing if they can come up with some clever tech to do it. Um, and then you hand it over to the riggers and animators proper and even then there was further paint overs and draw overs constantly to keep the style consistent and push it further. So like the whole concept thing permeated throughout the entire project. Um, uh, charge, on the other hand, it was the entire other way around. Like this is one of the original concepts, which kind of like summarizes the character design in a way. Um, and uh, we didn't really need any uh, design pose or expression tests to see how the character would look like because we figured out early on like what the character was supposed to look like based on some references that we, look, we were looking at, some actors. And uh, then it was really, it, the, di the, the design aspect was done. It was really just down to executing it in as much detail as possible, making it look realistic, um, which was a lot of fun. It, ha it was challenging in its own way, and it was fun to uh, keep referencing various photos and videos that we made. Uh, I wish we could have used something like scan data, but it was a lot of manual uh, sculpting and modeling. Um, which then needs a shit ton of references. It was like a lot. Um, but it's uh, interesting how uh, at some point we needed to go more into detail and because we were sculpting a lot of the details on top, uh, the retopology was actually completely locked. Like uh, we had to figure out the topology early on so that uh, a, a lot of the final sculpting, which actually happened in layers, we used an add-on just to uh, like figure out and test a workflow that we wanted to implement before any features could be implemented properly. Um, but yeah, uh, most of the time, I would even say, went into figuring out that workflow and making it actually usable. Um, so a lot of the modeling happened in the detailed areas. So there was a lot of uh, non-destructive layers of sculpting and that was used then to <laughs> figure out the deformations because we uh, uh, had a realistic face and need, needs to deform realistically. So uh, we were looking up uh, a system that is called FAX. It stands for Facial Action Coding System. And that is basically a way of um, sorting all of the and, and categorizing all of the different uh, muscle movements that have, uh, like the facial uh, muscles can do and um, then giving them a number. Uh, like I was starting to figure out how we could implement that and uh, sculpting it, but we realized early on that that would be mean way too many displacement textures and shape keys that we could possibly implement in Eevee. Uh, there's only so much memory. So uh, I started combining them into, first of all, culling the amount of uh, uh, actions down to whatever we need actually in the movie. He has a beard, so we don't need that many deformations around the mouth. Um, and then uh, combining the ones that actually uh, are really working well together because they move in a similar direction. And then those ended up in just six uh, def deformation layers, essentially, which we could then uh, implement selectively with uh, painting and masks where certain deformations should fire up. So that can then be handed over to further rigging and shading and they just implement the, the shape keys and the displacement maps properly. 
Um, there was also a bit of experimentation with ABC maps for wrinkle deformation for the small details. Uh, that I think mostly just ended up being experiments because we ended up just making it mostly procedurally. It's like a bit of a mixed uh, bag of like all the different workflows that we ended up using. Uh, but it was still really fun to to try to figure out how to do this in a proper sculpting workflow. Um, because uh, one of the tricky things that uh, was really is to is to test the what you're actually sculpting. Uh, like a really important aspect is the sliding of the skin because you can you can basically just sculpt whatever expression and make it as realistic as you want. But if the skin doesn't actually properly slide and deform along those uh, deformations, then it will look weird and everything looks like it's swimming. So we actually, like I typically started first just sculpting the general skin sliding and the broad deformations. And for that, uh, we also used geometry nodes, thanks to Simon for helping out making some of these, uh, like preparing these setups to give some live feedback on where the stretching on the face actually happens. And then it's a bit easier to uh, debug the deformations and uh, smooth out some of those shape keys so that the skin sliding isn't as jittery. Um, then uh, in the end, an important aspect is also the baking. Uh, there's, uh, there was a lot, of a lot more effort needed on the baking process. And to get the most accurate results out of that, uh, we actually also ended up using geometry nodes. <laughs> so uh, there was uh, typically, like, because you can like read the differences between like the source and the target mesh and save that to attributes, if you have a high enough resolution, you could just bake that emission out from the shader and just bake that to a texture. Uh, that gave us a lot of flexibility of uh, baking accurate height maps or even vector displacement maps uh, with the, some downsides of it uh, generally not supporting smooth shading and also using a lot more RAM. But uh, on our computers, we kind of made it work. And that was then, was then used for baking displacements and uh, bump maps for not just the face, but also the clothing. We didn't really have the time to uh, do a lot of, uh, um, well, cloth simulations. So that was also handled more manually. And for every uh, major bone rotations, we had basically a shape for the jacket and the, the pants. And all of that was manually sculpted based on reference. And then again, triggered based on uh, masks to uh, apply that deformation specifically. And this was just like, for example, just a testing environment after I exported the shape keys and the displacement maps to actually see if it's working properly. Um, uh, the, yeah, there, there was a significant effort put on figuring out that workflow. And uh, we have like, I, I tried my best to like put all of that information online and doc document the, the process live as I was doing it, not just as a cheat sheet for myself if anything goes wrong or I need to make adjustments, um, but also that other people can actually read it as we were making the movie. So that's actually on this Blender Studio, the studio.blender.org website as uh, a course, like a training, uh, um, well, it's more uh, like a written documentation. Um, and that's also like it's documenting the, the successes, the overall process, how to troubleshoot things and also our shortcomings because this was after all still a relatively short production. And uh, there's also like a bunch of notes on what we should tackle next on optimizing the workflow further, automating some of the things and ideally also implementing some of the features proper with uh, the help of the developers to uh, figure out how this should be in Blender. Um, right. Uh, also, again, like um, I want to give some big thanks to uh, Kent Trammell, Daniel Beistet, and Chris Jones. They were like uh, also actively involved and just like, gave a lot of feedback and even some resources like uh, uh, brush textures, and that helped a lot during the process, saved us a bunch of time. Um, and yeah, just wanted to thank them again. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I think I would just hand it over to the rigging department. Hey guys, 
I'm Demeter. I rig things. And um, <clears throat> so when it comes to uh, pets or wing it and charge, there's obviously not a whole lot of overlap between the two productions. Um, but that in itself, I guess, is interesting. So I'm going to start with charge. And I'm going to try to sort of, I guess, point out the differences looking at, at first, uh, different eyes. So uh, this is Anar. Uh, that's the name of our main character in charge. And obviously, he has these realistic eyes. And um, I think something that's worth noting is that from an animator's point of view, these eyes are quite restricted and limited. All they can really do is, is rotate and, and blink, and, and that's kind of it. And so, you know, that, that means it's easy to, to rig, right? Uh, but so for one thing, and this is kind of only true for, for charge, um, the eyes and the eyelids are part of an intertwined system of, of facial areas. And so, for example, while you're rigging a realistic face, you might ask yourself, should the cheek control affect the eyelid? Because I mean, when you set that up and you try it out, it feels kind of right. Um, but then you ask yourself, should the nose affect the cheek? And you try it out and it feels kind of right as well. Like, yeah, when you move your nose, you move your cheek. It makes sense. So should the lip lips affect the nose? Because when you, know, when you move your lips in real life, your nose kind of moves. So now your lip is moving in the nose, and that moves the cheek. And so now when you're moving your lips, you're moving the eyelids. Uh, <laughs> and then your animators are sad. Um, <laughs> so we went back and forth for a while to figure out uh, an ideal control scheme that has a right balance of um, like automation and also you know, freedom and control. Um, and that was a bit tricky, but we got there eventually. Um, but that's what made a realistic eye challenging, I would say. Other than that, there's also the fact that it's very detailed, of course. Like, um, uh, do I have a slide about that, though? Yes. Um, so, yeah, realistic eyes are quite detailed. Um, there's a lot of little things that um, you have to take into account, um, uh, such as, like, this uh, I'm just going to call it the third eyelid that slides in as the eyelid, eyeball moves left and right. Um, the eyelids, of course, stick to the eye, sort of. Um, and even that was a question at first, like, do we want to automate that? And you kind of try it out, and then you just kind of listen to your animators. In this case, we decided, yes, it's, it's better if it's automated. Um, and of course, there's the little thing that everybody loves with the, the cornea pushing the eyelids forward. Um, and finally, the, the little um, uh, moisture mesh that uh, is um, something that uh, mostly Simon came up with, and I just had to rig. Um, so yeah, real eyes, very detailed, whereas what you'll see later on the, the pet's eyes, they're not, they're absolute opposite problems. Uh, <laughs> uh, but so also, interesting thing is that when it comes to like figuring out what real eyes look like, you don't really need concept art, obviously. So instead, we just looked at a lot of stock footage of, of older gentlemen's uh, eyes, um, which, you know, it's one way to save some budget on... Um, on concept art money, but it's a way to lose your artist's sanity. Uh, but hey, at least we got a nice wallpaper out of it. Feel free to use. Um, so yeah, uh, when it comes to like finding the the style on charge, it was just about observing reality and converging towards that sort of fixed point in style uh, as far as we can. And you know, we don't have to go all the way. It doesn't have to be hyper realistic. Uh, but we knew that we wanted to approach realism. Um, but anyways, uh, real humans are kind of boring. You've all seen real humans. You can just look to your left. Um, so that after this production, we decided we would like to shake things up. And that's why we, uh, I guess, ended up with uh, Wing It. Um, and so instead of having a fixed style that we are aiming for, throughout the development of Wing It, we just, want, we just knew that we wanted to push things, whatever that means. And we didn't really know where the limit was until, or where different limits were until we hit them. Um, for example, looking back at the, the eyes again, uh, I think I might need to hit play. No. No. Yes, it's working, yeah. Um, so these eyes, uh, as you can see, is just kind of a 2D plane um, that is just a, a curve that controls like a sausage outline um, and then there's a black dot in the middle. Um, so it's, it's very simple, in a way. And in a technical sense, it's quite unrestricted compared to the realistic eye that you saw earlier. Because you can, I mean, you can shape this into any shape that you want, and you can disconnect it from the face, make it fly around. Um, but so the process of figuring out these eye controls is more so about figuring out 
the restrictions that we want to apply on ourselves and like finding the limits of the style like what actually looks good and what doesn't look good like what i'm doing there currently does not look good so you wouldn't do that um but that wasn't obvious until until you try uh, for example a small detail here is that the the top area is a bit thicker than the the bottom like the top rim is thicker than the bottom rim and that kind of stuff um okay and I want to uh, just uh, bring back this uh, slide from, from Yulen's section um, because I just want to, I guess, point out that it was interesting when, like, imagine that you're me, but you haven't made this movie yet, and you have a team that is counting on you, and they're bringing you these drawings, and they're like, so, you know, can you do that? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think what I used to say, but I'm pretty sure, like, no one really registered it. What I would say is like, I'm pretty sure I can get you 80% of the way there. And in the end, I think that's pretty much what we got. And I hope that uh, we're happy with that. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Um, but yeah, because I mean, yeah, some of these things that you see in these tests, I think you can't really do with the rigs unless you, I guess, try really hard. Um, but hey, the movie still looks good. So yeah, that's another kind of limitation, which in this case was like a technological limitation that we didn't know what it was until we found it. Um, Right, so the hardest part um, of the winged characters was obviously the, the mouths, the mouth tech, um, because of this, because it was crazy. Uh, the guys wanted to push it crazy far. And if you want to learn more about that, then you can check out my talk from last year, which obviously I don't have a screenshot of, because, I mean, not yet last year, yesterday. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about the, the winged uh, mouth rigs, uh, check out my 15-minute uh, classroom talk. Um, okay. And now moving on to the body rigs. Um, again, the two uh, productions had completely different challenges. I'm sticking with uh, Wing It now, for now. Uh, so these body rigs uh, were actually kind of not that hard, arguably, to create. And part of the reason for that is because it's sort of modular, as you can see here, that uh, you can disconnect everything. And when things are that way, it not only gives animators more freedom to do stuff, it also makes my life a lot easier because throughout this whole production, I didn't have to rig a single uh, waist and shoulder area. And if you ever try doing that, then you know that this was pretty great. Um, so that was a, kind of a, a pleasant uh, experience, I guess, to rig these guys. Um, another interesting thing that is unique to, to wing it is sort of the, the squashiness of the spines in particular. And now when you look at it in the, at the, at the final results, it looks kind of so obvious, like, of course, this is how it should behave. Um, but it actually wasn't like crystal clear to me. Uh, and I actually worked a lot with, um, with one of my animators, Pablico, um, and he sort of uh, helped uh, nail down the, the shapes of this uh, squishy, squashy spine. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty glad uh, with how it turned out. So thanks to him. And um, yeah, we love to recycle old tech, of course, because it's efficient. And so we ended up uh, bringing back a feature that we used back on Sprite Fright, which is this sort of automatic um, um, auto rubber hose elbow tech thing uh, that you can see here, where you just kind of scale a bone and you get an automatic nice curvature in the arm if you choose to. Uh, so whereas in contrast, going over to Charge, which had uh, these sort of realistic robots, which are very much not flexible and noodly. Um, one of the goals that we had for these designs um, of the robotic elements was to have these single axis mechanisms. So you can see how each um, sort of different area only rotates on one axis. And so to get three axes of rotation, you have three different uh, points of connection. Um, we wanted to avoid ball joints because ball joints are lame. Everyone does ball joints and we wanted to make our life difficult. Um, and soon after we found out why people avoid ball joints, because indeed our life became difficult, because it turns out when you have this kind of IK setup, you can very, very easily run into a situation like this, where you're just trying to move from one pose to the other, and you know, because you have these single axis points of rotation, uh, the only way the IK constraint can resolve the, the angles that it needs to reach a certain point is, well, to go haywire, basically. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so the same issue was present on the main character as well, of course, who also had the robot arm and uh, had a similar design principles of these single axis rotations. Um, and so you might wonder, how did we fix that? Uh, well, we didn't. 
I, I just uh, kind of, it's just one of those times, sometimes you, you just gotta look your animators in the eye and just be like, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is what it is. Um, so that's that, and to be fair, part of the part of the issue was this: like I can blame Blender a little bit, because um, when it comes to Anar, we could make the 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 IK elbow pole target work, but on the robot we couldn't do that because it turns out when you have too many locked axes in an IK chain, the pole target doesn't work anymore. Uh, but anyways, uh, here's the the setup for the, the robot's foot. Uh, we, we put quite a bit of uh, time and brain cells into this guy as well. Uh, there was some back and forth between like rigging animation and then we even uh, asked for some modeling changes to, to make this mechanism work. And in the end, it, it works pretty nice. I'm, I'm quite happy with it. Um, and uh, let's, see, let's see its uh, appearance in, in the film, shall we? Are you ready? <laughs> Look at the foot. <laughs> That's it. So, moral of that story, I don't mean to make fun of us too much, so I mean, you can look, you can look at it in different ways. Is it a great attention to detail? Is it a waste of time and effort? It's up to you. But so the reality is that when we were developing this, we didn't have a layout yet. We didn't know how much uh, different parts of the character might actually be visible in the film. So, you know, we just got to make sure that everything works. Um, and it's just something that can happen when you're kind of laying down tracks in front of you as you're going, which uh, we're trying to, you know, improve on uh, as we mature. Uh, okay, and finally, uh, I just wanted to mention that all of the charge characters um, are now free to download on our website, uh, studio.blender.org. Uh, you don't even need to register. You just go on the website, uh, you click on characters and these ones are free. Um, and then if you want to support us so that we can torture ourselves even further by using alpha versions of Blender and trying to make movies on it, then you can um, yeah, uh, become a subscriber and get access to, our, to the assets of our latest film, which in this case is, uh, of course, Wing It. Uh, and that's it for me. And then I would like to welcome Publico. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Pablo. I'm suffering. Uh, I'm trying to animate <laughs> rigs that that guy is doing for me. Um, I'm gonna go fast because animation is animation and it's always the same. Uh, but um, we had I, what I encountered is was um, we had a, I had different challenges within the different parts of the animation. So in this case. Um, I'm going to show you um, what uh, um, sequence was looking like. Uh, this is the first layout sequence that we get before we had anything to animate. I, uh, I did this by myself following some healthy notes. So it's like a really just few poses, putting the cameras and uh, having all the feeling OK, how it's supposed to be. Um, this one is something that we did after that, and it's a, we did a pass of a uh, mountain sequence, but just with video, refer video references. That's something that we did tons of video reference, a lot of re video references, until we get like the, the, um, the text that we wanted and we put them together. So like this, we were able to uh, make our um, blocking pass, that is this one having a solid base is what we wanted to do. And after that, it's the normal process. We just uh, continue doing the spline and the polishing. Um, for a project like Charge, the polishing pass, it takes a bit longer because you need to make more interaction and you have to animate more frames that you do something like uh, um, wing it. That is something is on two, so it's easier to uh, to skip some process. But um, yeah, the, the only thing, this, this kind of polishing it makes the animation really expensive and then you have to fight your battles in a way. So yeah, that was it is. Uh, now I would like to focus a bit more on one of the shots. Uh, 
Yeah, this is the layout of the shot. As you can see, they are like everything uh, is not a still not model. We have like a provisional props and it's everything. Yeah, it's really rud rudimentary. After that, uh, we did We did a pass on uh, different takes of how he should be taking the, um, the, the prop. We put all the cameras how they're supposed to be, um, following the layout. We put all the tools that he was going to use. We recreate everything. We put the table at the same height that he was going to use it. We bought a card jack. We 3D printed the pieces for the card jack. So everything is there to be, to be able to have the most realistic uh, takes that we could do. So we try different stuff. We always recorded different um, animators, video reference, just to, um, to have different, different, um, yeah, video, different video references that we could point at we, what, what we like it or not. So this basically is the ma main difference between the two process, between the two shots. Uh, after that comes the normal blocking. It's the normal stuff like uh, now from here is the, is the same like uh, you will do after that you have a policing pass oh you first you spline it and then you saw it you get notes you saw the blocking you get more notes you saw the spline you get notes you know the normal process of animation and after that we get more notes yes <laughs> <laughs> and this is the final um the final policy pass when you already make all the um, you animate like all the other parts like the hanging thing from the car jack and everything is perfect and marvelous and you ship it to the next department and now for wing it we base everything more on sketches and drawings because we didn't need to record ourselves as a fat dog <laughs> so uh, it was more like a 2d creative process Instead of being, be, being having video sequences all the time, it was just drawings. Uh, we asked Vivian to do um, poses for us even before we had rigs, so we had something to aim to, to aim at when we were uh, having like so any test, or any rig. Sorry, like for example here uh, at the bottom, the, we had the, in these poses we, I wanted to recreate, and then we have like the first version of the rig, and then it was like just. Yes, try to do it. How far can we go? And then we had to have a lot of interaction with the rigger because it was not the best. <laughs> but it was later the best, but we, you know, that's what we animators and rigger do, you know, like we love each other and hate each other. <laughs> so same, all this, uh, all this really helped us a lot to um, develop um, the shape language that we, later we will uh, use on the, on the rig, like for example, the all the torso deformation that the Met was talking about, it, we figured out in this stage of the, of the pre-production. Uh, we did the same with the cut. Uh, before we have anything, we had already like um, drawings that we could uh, replicate. And in this case, we also take, um, Vivian took uh, a storyboard from Rick and uh, tried to explore further how the character could be. And then really help from with the attitude and the emotion of the characters in each part of the movie. And later, um, yeah, the same, like we, um, we found out like uh, we, could, we, we didn't want to have any angles on the, on the arms and the legs. Also in these stages, it was helping us to have um, clean lines in the, and rubber hose limbs. And then I want to show you a bit uh, the same process I did with Einar, but in this case, in Wing It. So this is what Rick gave us as a storyboard. This is the first pass of lay, uh, first, pa first pass of layout. Then it was notes over that, and then it became something like this. So I took this, I start to push all the timing and the rhythm, following the same principle that he was going to smash everything. And after that, when I had this, I saw it to Rick. I said, like, "Hey, Rick, what do you think?" And he started to do scribbles. Like, no, this like this, and this like that. And he started to give me feedback. But in this case, the feedback is a bit different. As you can see, every red dot is um, a note that he was giving. 
but the, in the, um, we didn't have to record references again. It was just like, push this, push this arm hub, push, push this time in here. So everything was a bit more um, artistic in a way. You know, you didn't need to go back to the, take your camera and do stuff. So if, if it felt a bit more um, organic, organic in a way, you know, it was like more just draw. Uh, and after that, then I took my uh, blocking, I polished it, I added all the extra stuff that is happening here, all the movement, and I was done. So yeah, next up is Simon. So please. Hello, I'm Simon. Uh, I did the shading and effects on both those films. Um, when talking about the differences between those two projects in terms of shading and effects, it's a bit tricky because basically the sum of all of the shading on both films is the differences. Um, well, let's try anyways. So I'll start with the similarities. We rendered both of them in Eevee. Um, and that's about it. So <laughs> I want to talk a little bit like more broad scope about the differences in uh, like a more global picture and then go over a, a whole zoo of things that we came up with to fix some of those things. So in terms of general style, obviously like Charge is leaning more in towards a realistic uh, style while uh, Pets is going wing it, sorry, into the cartoon territory. And there is like a certain like story emphasis on that as well. Like we, with the realism, we're trying to uh, create like a certain believability and an emotional connection for people to connect with the story, to add like weight to every single action and with the effects also to make them look realistic and make it look like the character is actually being impacted by uh, what is happening on screen. And with the cartooniness, we're kind of trying to push a little bit more that kind of exaggeration to push the humor and just allow for some of the gags to be like a little more of like a physical humor that you couldn't really do with a realistic style. Um, and then in terms of uh, overall look, to achieve that kind of stuff, you want to go for more of like a, a depth. So with the, the whole shading idea and also the general rendering, you're trying to create more depth and dimensionality <clears throat> to also bring the viewer closer into the action. And with the uh, more cartoony style of uh, Wing It, we're trying to go in the opposite direction where we create more uh, of kind of a flatness to emulate that cartoony feeling and uh, create very clear shapes that can support the... Uh, the exaggerated poses and stuff like that. And then in terms of detail, it's also basically the opposite where in, uh, for the realism, we're trying to push, push a certain level of complexity to make it believable and add like a certain level of richness in what we're seeing. And for, uh, for the cartooniness, we're trying to go in the opposite direction of pushing more of a simplicity by removing certain detail that is not really necessary, just creating additional noise. Uh, to set like a very clear focus on characters and actions and also emulate that hand-drawn look. And then to achieve these kinds of things for rendering, of course, for realism, it's very clear. You just go with PBR. It's just conventional. You just do that. You're going to be good. And then for the cartoony look, it's MPR, which that can basically mean anything. Um, and it's a little bit more tricky to figure out what you actually develop for that thing. And it's a more artistic uh, expression when you uh, are in that NPR workflow. And that also means for the uh, focus that we needed to set in terms of shading and effects, what we want to uh, focus on in terms of how we achieve these kinds of things. For charge, that meant a little bit more focusing on the execution of, OK, we know where we're going to go. It's going to uh, look somewhat realistic. How do we uh, achieve that? How do we uh, work to get to that goal? And then for uh, Wing It, it's a little bit more on the technology side. Like, what can we even do? And then developing that as, uh, at the same time as we try to find the look of the film. So it was like also a very different approach in terms of the process of what we were doing. All right, so now uh, bear with me. I'm going to try to go through as many like, uh, things that we came up with to achieve these kinds of uh, solutions as I can. For charge, in general, we're trying to, well, I was trying to go for a procedural approach as much as I could because that's something that I'm personally also comfortable with and it helps me to uh, be quite efficient with iterating over different variations of textures. So here you can see a procedural uh, wood material. 
but it obviously comes with a lot of restrictions also in terms of uh, performance, for example, like we were using uh, EV and doing a lot of like back and forth, also seeing how we can push the performance to make it as real time as we can, which, well, spoiler alert, the files aren't actually real time when you play back, but I mean, <laughs> um, but yeah, to, to be able to push it a little bit better into the performance, uh, I started baking out textures but not in, instead of baking them at the very end to bake the different PBR layers, I started baking out tileable noise textures that then I use for the procedural approach, which basically the node tree looks the same. It's very it's still a complicated node tree with a lot of flexibility. We can change all the parameters uh, and it doesn't have the issue with the uh, resolution that you lock yourself into with the, uh, by baking the end result, but uh, yeah, it still has all the benefits of the procedural approach. And for that, we had some setups like uh, something to bake uh, bake out tiling noises, like some utility node groups that I just made where I had a library of stuff that you could just plug in and it would just uh, work very easily. And then a node group to untile it again because, I mean, if it's just perfectly tiling, it also doesn't look great. So, for example, for some of the materials in the uh, factory floor here, it was just very easy to take some tiling textures, slap a node group to untile it again in there to get some variation and just use that for like a random uh, rotation offset or something like that. Uh, and then something that I started to do a lot also for uh, charge was to uh, use geometry nodes to create some tileable uh, patterns very easily by just flood filling a UV tile with some geometry. Like here, I'm just adding just a bunch of very simple curves, meshing them with geometry nodes, and then making them more uh, complex and adding some additional fuzz to create this kind of uh, textile pattern. So that's the, the canvas texture that we had. And that's very easy to just bake out the normals, the height map, everything that you just get for free out of the 3D result into a tileable texture. And it's also very easy to create variations for different type of textile. Uh, and you get a lot of information for free without doing photo scanning and still having a lot of uh, high resolution results. And then also uh, using that in different materials, like here um, I have this woolly hat uh, texture. And um, one thing that I utilized this technique for was also to be able to receive additional meta information about the structure of this kind of pattern to, uh, maybe I go back, like this, this UV map here you can see makes us able to remove the tiling in terms of like the noise that we get uh, on top of the individual like cells of this texture. And then in general for the texture painting, I also went for a very procedural approach where it just had mostly procedural setups that would uh, be a PBR material that is mainly based on one single input texture that can just be used for uh, painting and wear. And then you could very easily do PBR painting uh, on that single texture. And because it's using EV, you can actually see the preview in real time. And it was actually really, really fantastic to use. Which, of course, the setup takes a little bit, but if you know what you're doing, it's not too bad. And then uh, this was one thing that I like to show because it's like a nice little thing, a geometry node setup that is using the uh, UVs of a mesh to basically uh, stick a geometry on top of a surface, like a texture. So here I have a setup where I just draw in a simple curve and then with geometry nodes turn that into like a stitching pattern. And then uh, it just projects it onto the uh, like an Ainsheim geometry. And because it's just using the UVs and attaching it directly to the surface, you don't really need to worry about deformation. It just behaves like a texture, but it's geometry. And it just works. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, a lot of the things that I'm showing, you can just also go to our website and download the files, so uh, yeah. And another thing where we're using uh, geometry um, to add some of this uh, shading information rather than actually using textures is like for the detail of the blood in the beard, things like that, that will, would be a little bit more difficult to pull off in a convincing way just using shading. Uh, it's just sometimes easier to just actually use geometry and it, you don't have the issue of like getting to a good resolution in terms of textures because it's actually just rendered as geometry. Um, for the facial deformation, there was one thing that I invested quite a bit of time into, which is uh, creating a procedural uh, wrinkle map based on the deformation of the character's face. Um, it's a little bit more complicated. I'm not gonna go into too much detail of how that works, but uh, at the end of the day, we didn't 
use it to like that much of a high capacity, but we did use it in the final film. And uh, I'm pretty happy with the approach. Like it gives you a very, uh, very flexible uh, way of using the data of the deformation of a mesh with some directional information in the shader, which uh, I've created like a demo file that you can also download on our website where you can see how this actually just dynamically creates this kind of wrinkle map based on the deformation of a mesh. Yeah, I also wrote a relatively long and in-depth blog post or, uh, about this, which you can check out. And then in terms of effects, uh, something that we did a lot was rather than using simulation to create these kinds of uh, dynamic effects, just create uh, geometry nodes assets or uh, assets using geometry nodes to gen generate a mesh that is animated based on the scene time and then adding a whole bunch of parameters on top of that that you could uh, change to create more sparks or less or like different seeds and then adjust the timing all sorts of things which is just a very very nice way of iterating over a lot of shots by just drag and dropping the asset into the shot and just adjusting it to the where it needs to be and uh, we had our uh, Spark guy, Kelty, who is also the <laughs> director, layout department, editorial, and everything else. Uh, uh, yes, it's scattering that around the whole movie, having a lot of fun. Uh, another asset that we made was uh, this kind of smoke, which is also real time in Eevee. It's using a, an approach using planes, so just meshes with a bunch of sprites uh, as textures mapped on top, which is great because it can receive lighting very nicely. It's really terrible for performance, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it creates a relatively nice result and it's pretty cool to just like drag it in and use it as a background asset without having to worry too much about like setting up a simulation. Another thing that uh, I made for the movie, which we kind of also underutilized a little bit, but it was still fun to have, is a dynamic uh, lens flare effect, which is just a bunch of planes in front of the camera using a refraction shader to kind of simulate how the the image that you actually see would be deformed into a lens flare. So it's like trying to replicate what the an actual camera would do in EV, which is not accurate, let me tell you that. But uh, yeah, it's nice. And then here in one of the shots, you can see how the asset can also just be used with a bunch of parameters to create different effects. All right, let's move on to pets. So one thing, wing it. Sorry. One thing about wing it is that we, uh, for the style, decided to go a little bit uh, for a different style between the characters and the environments, which is also a little bit true to the cell animation that it's just kind of leaning towards. And uh, there was also a little bit of a technical reason uh, to that. For the uh, environment, we had this setup that we would very easily be able to uh, shade different, uh, different faces of an asset in a different color to just like lift or lower the values very easily to create this like fake 3D effect, which uh, kind of also creates these like uh, this, these patches of color in uh, in 2D that you would also draw a lot of the time to create some sort of rims or something like that. Uh, so we just had like a custom attribute that was just used in all of the shaders that you could set very easily from the edit mode. Another fact that we had to stylize reflections or well, shading in general was to facet the normals, which is something that we're doing not for stylized shading in general, to create like patches of color and breaking up the gradients. Like you can see on the, on the round joint, like if you turn that off, it's like super smooth. But with that normal faceting on, it just creates this breakup in color and these, uh, in the gradient and just these patches of color that you also draw in. And then for uh, other reflections, like the main reflections on some of the assets, we actually just used drawn in 2D textures that were just projected from the camera view, but locked to the position so it wouldn't just like stick uh, in the uh, view space. And then something that we had on top of basically everything, mainly on the characters, but also on the environment, was just in the, instead of using a diffuse shading model, just using subsurface scattering, which I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but it creates this very nice effect of blurring out the details and like getting a lot, uh, like losing a lot of this like depth information you would have in the mesh because of like some sort of deformation that the rig is creating by like these crazy poses and you just get rid of that entirely uh, and it get, kind of flattens out everything a little bit. 
Um, and then to glue everything together, we also had a paper texture on top of everything. It's like a very subtle thing. In, in the YouTube compression, you don't actually really see it that much. But it does help a little bit, especially because it, it is actually just a 2D texture that is in camera space. And it counteracts this effect that you get from like looking at a surface at an angle that looks like it is perspective. If you have like that little bit of texture on top that is actually flat, it does help to make it look a little bit more uh, cartoony and drawn. Outlines, well, <clears throat> okay. So we also had outlines on this film. I'm not gonna go into too much detail how we did that. I'm just gonna say we used the custom geometry notes uh, solution for that. There's also the grease pencil stuff. We looked into it, but uh, there were some things that we couldn't do with it that we wanted to do. So I just tried and well, I mean, it kind of worked. <laughs> uh, there, I have a setup on our, our website in the blog post as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in another one. But yeah, if you want to try it out, you can also go there. Um, so yeah, we had like a little bit of a different setup between the outlines for the environment, which were actually created as geometry in 3D for each shot. And uh, in the shot, to actually get an outline to one of the objects, it would be as easy as placing it in the right collection and then giving it this uh, line properties modifier where you could then uh, set up the color, thickness, and stuff like that for the outline uh, and just specify it that way. And then an additional thing that we had was the ability to just draw in uh, lines and they would be rendered in a very similar way also towards the camera and um, then it would stick to the surface so you wouldn't have to worry about deformation too much. And that could also be used on the shot level to just draw in additional detail, which is something that we wanted from the very beginning, but weren't quite so sure how much we could actually do it because of budget. But uh, it's a very nice way of differentiating different shots that are with a different uh, focus on, on a different uh, uh, POV where you're like more in a close-up shot, you want a little bit more detail. So like on the close-ups, we really use this tool a lot to just add that little extra detail. And then for the characters, uh, a lot of the effects that we wanted to have in lighting, which Andy will talk about a little bit more, were done in the shader itself. So part of that is the outlines for the characters as well, which use the same base setup as the environment outlines to just identify where the outline should be. But then the rendering was not actually done as a mesh that you just have on top of the rest, like it is like with a line art modifier and with the out, uh, environment outlines like I just showed. But instead it was rendered inside of the, uh, as part of the surface with a shader. And then additionally, using that same information, we could also create these kind of fake rim lights that you can see where we're changing the color and like giving it a different angle. And uh, this additional layer of uh, this cell shading or yeah, kind of tune shading effect where you could just orient it around the, on the character as you want. And the way that is done, wait, this is different. Oh yeah, you can see how this is actually just on top of the shader and obviously it's only oriented towards the camera, which right now I'm going into a different view than the actual shot camera. So it doesn't work at all, it just falls apart. But from the view of the camera, it looks right. And the way it's done is by just getting a bunch of information out of geometry nodes as attributes. Like here I'm using distance fields that I, uh, that I generated from the identified outline position in camera space. And then using those to set up the outlines with a certain thickness that I can just easily choose because I have the distance field uh, in the shader itself. And then some additional normal information to make those fake rim lights uh, by deciding where and what direction towards the camera, the rim light should be placed. And then these different effects that were actually done in the shader. Yeah, well, <laughs> not, not tree cleanup is a little bit difficult, sorry. Um, are just stacked or layered on top of each other. Like we have like the base color and then the outlines, the fake rim lights, the cell shading and additional effects like the paper texture. And those actually just used as the color information for the subsurface scattering shader that we use for the rendering. And there's also a blog post about a lot of this stuff. I'm going to follow it up with another one that's more specific about the character stuff. Okay, effects, <laughs> last thing. Uh, for uh, Wing It, the effects were a little bit, yeah, weren't less tricky than the shading for sure. But we had like a similar thing. We had a bunch of uh, effects assets that were just set up with geometry nodes, which is like a simple setup. Here you can see the setup for the uh, rocket engine. 
And then just like a very simple rig to be able to pose the effects asset in the shot and just put it somewhere and make it work. And then, hey, the sparks are also making a comeback. Uh, just this time as hay particles. It's very nice if you're able to just easily reuse some assets that you created for another film. Just add some more turbulence, make it a little bit slower, and it looks like hay. Uh, and then this I just wanted to show. We also underutilized this, but uh, it's still fun. Uh, simulation nodes made it into Blender, and we wanted to try it. We wanted to use it in a film, because why not? It just came out, so probably not going to break. Um, and it was really fun to play with this, but it's not super controllable, as you can see. Like, you give it the initial shape, but then what if you want to have it go in this direction? Okay, I mean, it's a bit difficult to control. So most of the time in the more important shots, I didn't use this setup, I did it in a different way. But some of the shots still do this. And what this is, is basically just using simulation nodes to do like a fake kind of 2D smoke simulation based on curves. So because it's 2D, we don't really need volumes or like dimensional meshes. So instead, I just use the curve and expand it a little bit randomly and uh, subdivide it and like split it up here and there. And uh, yeah, with the nice simulation nodes, you can create a very complex setup very easily like that. And uh, let's move over to Lighting and Comp by Andy. Wow, that was a lot of information. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna make it a little bit more simple. So I'm gonna talk about lighting, which I did on both of these projects together with uh, Bo Herbrands uh, at the studio. And uh, so first, for charge, uh, it was a very, uh, fairly realistic uh, approach in lighting because the film was supposed to be fairly realistic in a, as real time as we could make it. So um, the lighting itself was very cinematic there was, uh, it was uh, uh, driven by the environment mostly. There was this juxtaposition between the main character and this evil factory. So the main character has these very warm colors and the factory is uh, kind of cold. And uh, we wanted to create this cinematic effect by having a lot of uh, depth uh, and layer separation um, and kind of work with more uh, cinematic lighting methodologies where you drive, uh, we, you start out with the set lighting and then you, uh, you use that to drive the character lighting. Um, so uh, in overall, the look was kind of uh, muted colors, uh, sci-fi, uh, sort of semi-realistic. And as uh, Simon said, we're, uh, we rendered this with uh, Eevee. So the really cool thing was that uh, it was very immediate to work with. Um, we tried to make the viewport uh, setups as responsive as possible with uh, you know, very uh, you know, lower geometry, not all the hair but we got it pretty close to the final render. Um, <clears throat> sorry. And uh, in general, that meant also because we had a fairly limited time budget, we wanted to make things a little bit more uh, streamlined. So for example, all the factory shots, we started with the practical lights that were already built into the set into separate collections that we can uh, toggle on and off. And then uh, um, like you would do on set lighting uh, on a, uh, a real-time on a real production, um, you you know would uh, emphasize your characters and separate them out. So I'll give you a, a short breakdown of a very simple shot. And uh, so we would start with the base HDRI lighting, um, which is basically giving, giving us a reflection layer and some fake uh, EV lighting. Um, this was actually one of the HDRI maps that are uh, baked into Blender. It has this kind of uh, cold look. And uh, next up, we would include the light sources from the set. And then you could see already that we have some fog already built into the world, which helps us with this layer separation. And uh, on top of that, we would add uh, more background lighting to add interest or to mask out certain areas. For, um, for example, like some of the lighting and reflections would show up in the background, and we didn't want that. Um, and then we would focus on the foreground lighting, which was mainly done with uh, area lights and uh, to mask out the characters, make them stand out. Uh, um, you, would, you would do in a live action production with big, uh, um, big light blockers and that kind of stuff. And then uh, finally to add focus on top of everything, we used uh, uh, shadow casters, we call them, um, which are basically these objects that don't show up in rendering, um, but they just uh, block out light in certain areas. 
and that makes us really focus on the characters. We want to be very selective about, about that. Uh, yeah, and that's the final shot. Likewise, with the compositing, uh, we wanted it to be fairly simple. Back then, we didn't have the real-time compositor working that well, um, but uh, we uh, made several base node groups that could give us certain effects, and these effects were always kind of uh, very um, camera-like effects. So we had some uh, some blooms, some uh, lens dust, which I'm going to go into, uh, some film grain, some chromatic aberration, vignetting, sharpening, and desaturation in the end, and we plonked those into uh, every shot. So uh, since those were node groups, they would propagate into all the different shots. And uh, we had some values to tweak them. But uh, overall, we used the same kind of values for everything. So all the shots ended up to uh, being, you know, fitting into the continu continuity. Uh, so for lens dust, um, sorry, we actually took a shortcut. Um, we had a procedural uh, kind of solution first, but we wanted to give this character, uh, this, this camera, a very uh, realistic, gritty look. So um, uh, we wanted some dust in the lens in almost every single shot. And uh, we did that by just taking a couple of pictures of fairy lights and then uh, with uh, lots of bokeh, and then uh, using that in the compositor through this node setup. And uh, it's uh, hopefully not too disturbing. It's a kind of a subtle effect, but you can see it in a lot of the shots. Just helps us make it make the whole world feel a little bit more grounded. Next up, there were some shots that were more uh, complicated in terms of compositing, um, uh, where we had to comp uh, combine different layers of uh, render engines. We had, uh, for example, this matte painting shot, which the background was rendered in cycles, because uh, you know lots of complexity, and uh, the foreground was rendered in Eevee. So uh, yeah, so we have the different layers. This is the map painting. We, uh, we rendered it. We constructed this whole environment and then rendered it and uh, painted over it in Krita and then projected it back into some simpler uh, geometry into the same scene using the same camera. Um, but with that, we get a very realistic sort of base set. Uh, we added uh, real-time fire that you can see uh, also at the same uh, place in the distance. So cameras would line up and everything. Um, we would add the road, the cars, and the reflections on the roads. And that was rendered with Eevee, but they were fairly simple models that Kjalti actually created in layout. Um, they may, still made it in the film. Um, but yeah, we had all the reflections already baked into that pass, and it, that's actually how the pass looked like just in real time uh, in the viewport. And then we would have some environment bloom, which is uh, correct based on the distance that we're observing it. And then uh, we have just rendered the foreground layer in Eevee. So that's what you can see here. Um, and then finally, on top of that, we added some bloom and lens dust effects and grading, vignetting, and that's the final shot. Fairly straightforward. On, on Wing It, on the other hand, it was uh, kind of different. So uh, the whole movie was supposed to be yeah, you can keep the audio down. It's not supposed to play that long. So the whole movie had this uh, 2D cartoony style, completely different from what we've done before. Um, and uh, also, I've uh, hardly worked in that uh, environment before, so it was a little bit of a learning, learning curve. The great thing was that uh, we, had, uh, we had Vivian, uh, who would come up with a lot of reference for everything. So there were some color scripts, and uh, you know every every shot basically had all the colors uh, locked down basically. So it was super great to have all this reference. Um, in in the end, we did a lot of color matching by eye um, to make sure that uh, the colors that we would get in the renders are exactly or kind of similar like the colors uh, that we had in, in the concepts. Um, yeah. In terms of lighting, uh, what that means is that generally uh, we have flatter colors, we have lots of really big gradients, we have sharp shadows and very thick outlines, and the characters are simple in a kind of cell animated style, and they, the, the style kind of uh, is a little bit different from the backgrounds. So the background are painted, the characters are in a cell, uh, more like uh, with ink. So. Um, how did we do that? Well, Simon showed these uh, shader setups, which uh, made the environment pretty blocky. And uh, the, 
general approach was that we would have only one light source that would cast a shadow, and most of the lights, most of the objects were actually disabled for shadows. So there was no really complicated shadows. They were very, uh, fairly stylized and, and simple. So only the cockpit windows, for example, would have shadows, and the levers and light bulbs and all that didn't have shadows. And uh, then we placed around lights, and mostly the, the lighting from the environment was different from the characters. So what if I play, placed a sunlight uh, to, to light the whole scene, it wouldn't affect the character that much. Uh, we would do that with the lighting rig that uh, Simon made, and uh, there we try to match the environment light, kind of, but mostly the concept art. And we had a lot of control over it uh, for rim lights and outline color and all that kind of stuff. And uh, speaking of outlines, uh, uh, as was hinted before, we rendered the environment outlines in a separate uh, pass, so to speak. So we could light it separately, so we could get different effects for it, like rim lights. We uh, could place uh, lights into, into the outline collection and light it separately, give it more emphasis or not. And then uh, we would composite those back onto the uh, beauty renders. And the compositing was uh, fairly uh, automatic. We tried to make it build in our shot builder um, so what every shot would start out with the setup. Uh, so we'd merge the base layer to da uh, down with uh, some sort of uh, painterly effect. And uh, then we would render out the outlines and we composite them on top of that. And they, they're, these different layers are all using uh, these preset node groups that we built and uh, all of that was connected from the start, so the artist wouldn't have to worry about connecting everything, um, but we would have control um, using the, uh, the properties on the node. And what enabled us, uh, well, what that let us do is also to give a certain depth effect to the outlines and the environment separately. And then on top of that, the animators would make these uh, amazing grease pencil drawings um, that would uh, give us certain effects, and we also composite them, them into the shots. Uh, mostly they integrated fine, but we had to do some material adjustment because the animators didn't see the final renders, uh, so we would have to go in and uh, tweak the material. And it's actually fairly cool. Like we got the we got it to match the concept art uh, pretty closely in certain areas, so that's super cool. On top of that, we also did smears, um, not only the smears that the animators gave us, but uh, motion blur smears in camera. We made those with, uh, with grease pencil and then just uh, composited them on top. And then, as uh, Simon mentioned, we also had these lines. Um, everything, every asset had these line layers built in, and they would be separated out into separate passes. Um, but we could also, uh, we made this little add-on that would let us uh, select any object and then just draw lines on top of it and it would take the normal and the base color of the surface uh, as a preset already and you would be set to go. Um, and uh, in some shots we even managed it to project that line onto a deformed character which was pretty cool. Um, and uh, it's actually super fascinating because we went into a lot of uh, shots and actually scribbled in these lines and uh, to give them a little bit more interest and a little bit more of a hand-drawn feel, which was super rewarding, um, which we didn't have on a lot of productions to have that extra time to go back in, reflect, and see how we can push the quality. And uh, that was really super great in general. Um, we got a lot of, <laughs> at, at some point, we did the CBB pass. CBB stands for could be better. So everyone does their notes of what could be better in the shot. And, and we managed to address a whole bunch of them. So things like uh, make the pencil look more like a pencil, pencil because it looks weird. Uh, we could actually do that. So I'm super proud of that. And that about sums it up. So I'm back to tie this all up in a neat bow. Uh, just a quick point uh, to say that we will be live streaming the closing ceremony here. So you don't have to move. You don't have to run down the stairs. Anyway, there's no seat left in the theater. I can already tell you. 
so because I didn't work on charge myself, but I, um, so I just want to give a bit of um, feedback about what was just said because I can't do a comparison, so I'll just do my producer job, give retakes. Um, so we only have one rigging artist. Someone implied that we have riggers. That's not true. Uh, so if anyone is ever wondering about making a career out of rigging, you can. There's definitely studios looking for people like you. So Matt is the only person, you know, with the rigging department on his shoulders. Um, and I mean, uh, he also has quite a selective memory because I remember some complaining about rigs that he just called fun. I don't know. So it's maybe a quality that's needed for that, <laughs> for that job. Uh, Pablico also, who said that he was, uh, you know, getting a lot of notes, as any animator would say. Obviously, you were also giving notes to Met a lot. It's a love and hate relationship. You might have seen it in the vlogs by Haru. So. <laughs> um, and uh, Simon, I'm sorry, but um, it is wing it. <laughs> Maybe he's still in character from the whole production, you know. Uh, so those are two very different projects, both made on Blender, obviously, but also rendered on Eevee. So we stretch everything real far. And um, obviously, it's not just making the movies that the whole team does. Um, so they also participate in the development of the software by actually testing the features that come up. Like every day, we work on the daily build. Joy. <laughs> Nothing ever breaks. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's sometimes really rough, because what used to work on the day before doesn't work anymore. Um, and you would think that we have lots of technical support at the studio, because we have the developers just next door. Um, actually, we, they don't have that much. So they are very technical artists also, uh, working out their solutions by themselves and then bringing it upstairs to the developers, because literally upstairs is not like a hierarchy thing or anything. Um, and obviously, they also write articles and make videos to share all of that uh, we're doing. Not to say that this is the way, but to say this is the way we do it here, uh, which might be great for you if you're a small team, usually. So please, like, feel free to uh, go to the website, look at what we've uh, been, they've been doing for the past few years, look at the older films and their files, and uh, you can also obviously follow what we're doing with the next movie. Uh, Gold, that's uh, directed by Jerika, who is in the room right now. <laughs> um, so Gold is very different again. Uh, you might have seen it through the technical talk that uh, Sergei and Brecht gave this morning. So it's going to be another challenge rendered in cycles this time. Um, so I hope you can follow for the news support if you can. And uh, see you next year for more fun.